Welcome to 1.6 on the outer product. If you remember from last episode, you should remember that the cross product had a major problem, and that was that it didn't work in any dimension other than the three-dimensional reality in which we currently live, not including time. Anyway, the way to fix this is to introduce something called the outer product. This creates something this creates something called a bivector instead of an orthogonal vector. So instead of having a new vector come out of the two original orthogonal vectors that you're crossing together, you have a new bivector, which is a plane segment. And you can actually see that it has the same area that we talk about in section 1.3. But you'll also notice that these are non-commutative, or they are dependent on which ones you product first. Here are the properties of it. It is anti-symmetric, which is directly what I was uh, saying in the last slide. And that is saying that if you multiply B and A together, take the outer product of B and A, with B coming first, then that's equal to the negative of this, and that ends up with this equation right here. And therefore, it follows that any vector times itself is zero. But if you can think of that as the area, think of it as the area of the bivector, A vector oh, times the length along itself has no other components other than itself so it ends up being zero area they form a linear space just like vectors do and so you can use this linear space in the same way that you would normally use vectors and in two and three dimensions by vectors are very easy easy to visualize and even in v dimensions beyond that you can still think of them as a plane the product is distributive over addition the outer product while it defines a plane, must be in at least two dimensions to form an interesting product, which is good because why would you go below that? So let's take this orthonormal basis, meaning that these are unit vectors and they are orthogonal to each other. We can have the vector component notation right here of these two vectors a and b. This thus uh, brings us to the outer product of a and b, which is this is denotes as a wedge b. And anyway, it creates this thing right here, which simplifies down to this, which actually recovers the imaginary part from complex from the complex numbers video right here. And with a pretty simple proof, you can prove that this is the same component and has the same amount of magnitude, which is again, easy to visualize from those things I, I showed in the first sl slide, those images, because it is a bivector, it is a planar segment. Now, before we go into talking about the, th the outer product in the third dimension, we need to introduce handedness. We align the axis three with our thumb. So basically, let's draw a hand right here. Oh gosh, oh gosh, I'm not good at drawing. Okay, so then you have your thumb right here going up and your fingers are closing in this direction. Well, if you have axis three going along here, so this is the third axis, and then you have the first axis here, so this is three, axis one, and this is axis two. If axis one goes into axis two in the same direction that your hand closes, then it is a right-handed set. If not, it is left-handed. But this is only unambiguous in the third dimension. We don't use the term handedness in any other dimensions, at least if we want it to make sense. So now we come up with this product in three dimensions, which follows very similarly to what we had in the two-dimensional product except now we use the right-handed term and we use the same, this is essentially the same notation, just using Einstein's summation notation for these vectors being expanded in component form. And then they expand in the following way, which recovers the same components as the cross product. But it makes more sense having, like understanding why, uh, again, I don't know why the raised to exponents, there's a weird glitch with PowerPoint. Sometimes it does that as soon as I press record. But anyway, these products, like the reason that these are switched is because the anti-symmetric property of e to the th e sub three wedge e sub one, which will actually be explained in the next uh, slide. And note that this is not a new vector, but a bivector. This is a bivector, and these are the component forms of each bivector in specific planes. Now we can extend it um, out into arbitrary dimensions using this. So in an arbitrary dimension, this is the representation of these two products, where this denotes anti-symmetrization, which if you don't exactly understand that, think about why the t the uh, pseudo tensor, the levi civita symbol comes up in this. And that is if these two vector components are multiplied in a non 
a, an anti-cyclic permutation, then it becomes negative, which explains why we have the slight oddity in the middle of the cross, or not the cross product, but the three-dimensional outer product, which was in the last slide. Anyway, this shows that it's associative and makes it kind of makes it very easy to show what a trivector is, which is, by the way, is a directed volume, just in the same way you have a bivector, which is an oriented plane. And this is one of the reasons why I, I absolutely love geometric algebra, because you have a scalar, so I'll just represent that with an S, which is zero dimensional. So, you know, it's just a point. It's just a value. It doesn't represent any geometric value. But then you have a vector which is one dimensional and the vector can be expressed in a line with some kind of direction. And then instead of having the same amount, like expressing multi-vectors as still being vectors, geometric algebra says, then you get a bivector, which is two dimensional. And so then you get an oriented plane. And then when you go into three dimensions, you get the tri-vector, three dimensions. Now you have an oriented volume, which it, to me, makes so much more sense than the idea of everything all being called a vector and it's a bit ambiguous uh, one more example uh, that i really love to talk about is the equation for torque which torque is equal to uh, i believe it's radius times force where these are two vectors which if you like if you would look at this equation with the er, like the original interpretation this gives some vector which is perpendicular to these but it creates a rotational force so a perpendicular vector does not make any intuitive sense because you have this right here which you want to rotate and you have some radius r right here and you apply some force right here and let's just say that this force ha has like a vector pointing out this way. It makes so much more sense for this to create an oriented plane, meaning that there is a rotational force existing there. And so it's a much more intuitive way to interpret physics, which might be a perfect segue into why I'm not the best teacher of mathematics. I am not a mathematician. While I am getting a, finishing my degree in mathematics as well, I am primarily a physics major. And so I think in terms of physics, which is why I might not be the best mathematical teacher. But anyway, moving on from that weird kind of thing to point out, the outer product of any linearly dependent vector vanishes, which honestly, I don't want to explain too much because it's pretty easy to visualize. Basically, if you have two vectors, which are just like components of each other, it's the same reason why a vector wedge itself is equal to zero. It's the same logic used there. Anyway, yeah, thank you for watching. I hope this made sense. This is where we start to getting into interesting parts about geometric algebra. And it'll start getting even more interesting in the next episode where we go to section 2.1, which is the new vector product. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Bye.